Good day. This is Dr. Conrad Miller with your Fukushima update. Proceeding with part three from the New York City Fukushima Disaster Symposium lectures that I'm summarizing for you from March 11th, 2013. Now, David Lockbaum from the Union of Concerned Scientists told us that the tsunami hit 45 minutes after the earthquake happened. And he noted that for each reactor, you should have one diesel generator in case power is lost. Unfortunately, they only had battery power that lasted eight hours, and only one of the batteries worked. So far, the cost, according to Mr. Lockbaum, is about $250 billion tops, somewhere around 200 to 250, people are saying so far, for the Fukushima disaster and cleanup. He noted that the diesel-driven fuel pumps couldn't pump in cooling fluid against the high pressure inside the plant reactor when the accident occurred. They had to be able to vent the gases out so they can get the water in. And also they had eight days of no power to the Daiichi plant in Fukushima. Then we had Dr. Hisako Sakiyama. She was a member of the Japanese Diet Commission. The Diet is like the legislature in Japan, and they were investigating the Fukushima disaster. And she recalls that the textbooks originally stating sort of propaganda about how great nuclear power was were changed after Fukushima, but they still didn't talk about the toxic effects. She notes that for the Fukushima residents, they're going to allow 20 millisieverts per year or two rems per year when the normal back down background radiation is 200 millirems. So they're getting 10 times that dose. So that she's not too happy about that, especially for kids who are more susceptible and women. She notes that there's no safe dose of radiation that's been accepted by scientists, especially in the, the beer seven. That's the seventh beer report. That's the biological effects of ionizing radiation report. She told us that the energy of radiation like gamma rays is much stronger than the energy of chemical bonds that hold DNA together. A diagnostic x-ray, for example, is 15 to 20,000 times stronger than one of the chemical bonds in the DNA. So the radiation can easily produce double-strand DNA breaks, and then you get mutations and then you get cancer. She told us that TEPCO, that's the company that's controlling the plant, the electrical company, and they lobbied national safety committees in Japan to relax radiation standards. They also lobbied the International Council on Radiation Protection. Remember in the last video we talked about the United States National Council on Radiation Protection, which wants to increase uh, cleanup levels to possibly be safe at 2,000 milligrams. Uh, they lobbied at the IRCP in Japan they covered their travel, and she noted that all lobby requirements were reflected in the ICRP 2007 recommendations. She said that faxes were sent to give iodine to block the iodine receptors in the thyroid um, so the radioactive iodine wouldn't be the, one, the, the iodine that attached to the thyroid in Fukushima. But nobody picked the faxes up. So they went unheeded. And uh, she notes that of 38,000 children tested so far in the Fukushima area, three have confirmed thyroid cancer and seven suspected so far. Tests were done by Fukushima University. Then we heard from these two Navy quartermasters who are on the USS Ronald Reagan. And they were called to the area thinking that they were going to help the local people because of the tsunami and the earthquake that they heard about, but they didn't initially get told about the exploding of the plant. 
So they had to go on the decks and pull in the ropes and a lot of the radiation that was coming to the boat because the wind's blown off, you remember, and they're on the boat. They were within 10 miles for two months, two months. That would be in the exclusion area, 10 miles away. So Maurice Ennis, he developed funny lesions on his hands. They kind of had to scrape them away. They eventually discovered that they were radioactively caused. And um, he also notes that um, he developed, two months later, he developed lumps on his jaw, and then another one on the right side of his face, and another one above his left eye. He's lost a lot of weight. He's got, now he's got stomach ulcers, and his hair's falling out. He's a young guy. He's about 25. And then Jamie Plym, P-L-Y-M, she started having problems with losing a menstrual cycle. She's had repeat, repeated bouts of bronchitis, and she's developed asthma, which is kind of strange. Now the military, when you're in the military, they you had a sign that you, they aren't liable for anything that happens to you, and they weren't offered potassium iodide tablets to protect their thyroid, but the officers were, and the higher-ups were, they say. Um, then they had to, well, so they're suing TEPCO because they can't sue the Navy, but then the Navy said that they lost their medical records. They didn't monitor the urine or did do any whole body counts for anybody on the USS Ronald Reagan. And again, they were in the area for about two months between one and ten miles offshore as the radiation kept going toward the ship when the winds were blowing offshore from Fukushima. They were briefed not to tell the rest of the crew about the radiation exposure. And there were about a hundred people involved in the suit of TEPCO. The internet was shut off, they say. And cable was shut off, so people couldn't correspond to find out what was going on. When they finally did discover that it wasn't just a small leak, that the plants exploded, and all the things that were actually going on there, people started to try to commit suicide or get off the ship two months later. So that's going to be going on for these two quartermasters plus the other in 98. Then Stephen Starr from Missouri talked about the radiation from, for example, cesium. He tells us that two grams, there's 454 grams in a pound, two grams of cesium-137 can make a radioactive exclusion zone of one square mile, like Central Park. And then those two grams would be about as big as a dime. Uh, the radioactive plume went over Tokyo. 30% of the land in Japan is contaminated with long-lived radionuclides. And when they were testing people by doing a whole body count and getting their Becquerel count, um, for example, if you get exposed to 1,400 Becquerels and you weigh 70 kilograms, then you have 20 Becquerels per kilogram. But a child who gets 1,400 Becquerels and only weighs 20 kilograms is going to get 70 Becquerels per kilogram. So their dose is going to be three and a half times that per kilogram. So that the effect of the radiation is going to be much higher on kids. And they found, for example, from cesium, there's irreversible damage to the heart, the pancreas, the adrenals, the intestinal wall, and the thyroid. The international... Council on Radiation Protection assumes uniform incorporation in all organs, but actually certain organs bioconcentrate things more. In Belarusia, Dr. Bandachevsky noted that 45 to 47 percent of high school graduates had physical disorders, including gastrointestinal anomalies, weakened hearts, and cataracts. 40 percent had chronic blood disorders and malfunctioning thyroids. And this was in direct correlation to the Becquerel load in the body. Then there was Tim Wousseau, who's been going to Chernobyl for about 13 years. He's an evolutionary biologist. He's been tracking birds. And he's know, noted that most organisms show significant increased rate of genetic damage in direct proportion to the level of exposure to radioactive contaminants.
They may show reduced lifespans, fertility rates, reduced population sizes, and many species in notes are locally extinct. The birds, 40% are sterile. Some of the males have no sperm or not viable sperm. The thing is, mutations are passed from one generation to the next, and they show signs of accumulating over time because of the low radiation levels. They don't kill you, so you end up passing mutations on to the next generation. And all mutations are not expressed. Uh, so the cost, he was using a Geiger count that cost $15,000 to check out the radionuclides in the area. He noted that the International Atomic Energy Association, the IAEA, they're not a watchdog, they're a nuclear proponent agency, said that Chernobyl showed um, increased biota wildlife. How they determine that, he said. They never did any studies. Some areas have different radioactive contamination. One area south of Chernobyl has half the background radiation of Central Park. Some are very hot. Some are not. The bumblebee population has decreased radically in most highly concentrated areas of radiation. Same with spiders, butterflies. And he says there's no cobwebs in Chernobyl. No spiders. Mostly dogs and some wolves seem to have survived. And he says Chernobyl is not a wildlife haven. There are less species found about Chernobyl, especially in highly contaminated areas. And then a lot of the animals he studied showed deve developmental abnormalities, including cataracts in birds. And he has a paper coming out on that sometime this month. And the animals have lower fertility rates, and the mutations are migrating out of the affected areas into populations that are not exposed. We'll continue with uh, the next video uh, with the study about the water and the thyroid, and that'll be coming up in part four. This is Dr. Conrad Miller, and this is part three of your Fukushima update from the New York City, March 11th, 12th, 2013 symposium that Helen Caldecott organized.